Soul Drinker by Ben Counter Chapter 9, Part 2 This is a fan-made audio recording. Soul Drinker and Warhammer 40K are owned by Games Workshop, Black Library, and Ben Counter. Please support the official release. Soul Drinker, Chapter 9 The first thing Sasia Koroloth saw when she regained consciousness was the closest lab bench sheared in two, the edges dripping and melted. The equipment bolted to its surface had overloaded and was belching acrid smoke. One wall was spattered with black coolant spray fountaining from a severed hydraulic line. It was mixing with the blood on the floor, seeping from the bodies of her tech coven members that had been thrown around the room. Talon? Anyone? Koroloth hadn't been out for more than a couple of seconds, she was sure, but in that time her lab had been reduced to a ruin. She tried to haul herself to her feet, but the pain was making her groggy. The bones of one hand had been pulped by the violent vibrations of the soul spear as it tried to break free from the field cage. She coughed and peered through the stinking smoke of burning plastic. Galentian must have died instantly. There was a clean, round wound right through his chest. Vayan had probably taken a moment longer, for one arm and shoulder had been sheared neatly off when the soul spear had swung wildly in her grasp as the field cage began to fail. All around the lab, chunks had been sliced out of the lab benches, the equipment, the walls. The soul spear itself lay on the floor, white smoke coiling off it. "'Here, girl,' said Talon. Still a soldier at heart, he had hit the floor the instant the soul spear had come online and owed his life to it. "'I think it all worked a little too well.' "'Omnissiah, preserve us,' gasped Koroloth with a shudder, staring at Vayan's lopsided corpse. Did you see it? It was... magnificent. Twin blades of pure blackness, two tears in reality, shearing out from either end of the soul spear. It was as she had suspected. The soul spear generated a vortex field, just like a vortex missile or grenade, but it could maintain the integrity of that field instead of just unleashing it as an explosion. If they could unravel the inner workings of the soul spear, Think of the wondrous things they could make. In time, perhaps, came the sinister, hissing voice. But for now, Tech Priest Korolov, our objectives are rather less lofty. We must flee. Elhern caught Korolov's uninjured arm and pulled her to her feet with surprising strength. The Tech Guard will be coming. If they find out you have not been working alone, then Kabatov will find our true purpose here. You understand that cannot happen. Talon pulled himself upright. Where can we go? They have us surrounded. There are places, said Elhern. I have been on this planet some time. I know many of its dark corners where a fugitive might hide. Not just hide, said Korolov, her face pale and sheened with sweat as she fought off the pain. We have to finish this. We know what the soul spear can do. It is what we have been looking for all these years. It is why I gathered you and Vayan and Galintian. We have heard the true word of the Omnissiah, and we must offer up a sacrifice in return. Elhern headed towards the lab's entrance. Indeed we have, Tech Priest. The Omnissiah appeared to me, too, in his guise as the engineer of time, and told me all those things that you believe. And I know that he demanded you prove your worthiness to receive that truth. We will offer up to him the soul spear, but first we must ensure that we survive. Elhern took up the soul spear in one hand and led the survivors of Koroloth's coven out of the lab. Glancing around at the sound of approaching tech guard, he levered a panel away from the wall with his fingers to reveal the rusting hollow of a humidity shaft. Wordlessly, he dropped into the darkness. Talon followed him and, faint with pain but determined not to fall when she had got so far, Koroloth was last. If they could find a place to hide, if they could survive, 
Then they could complete the task that had been planted in the heart of tech priest Sasia Koroloth when the engineer of time had appeared in her dreams and begun to tell her the truth. She believed all his whisperings of how mindless and hidebound the Adeptus Mechanicus had become, of how an entire universe of arcane technology was gleaming beneath the surface of reality, begging for an open mind to uncover it. Since she had been given the soul spear to study, the certainty inside her had hardened until she knew what she must do. She would offer the soul spear to the engineer of time and see the truth for herself. At first, all the censors could come up with was a wave of contradictions. The unnamed planet was in far orbit around a near-dead star, and yet it was warm and teeming with life that showed brightly on the carbon scans even from the range limit. The atmosphere was theoretically human-breathable, but, in all probability, practically near-toxic. That there was oxygen at all was an anomaly, for the planet's surface was almost entirely ocean, broken only by scattered archipelagos and island chains, and there were no forests or jungles to act as the planet's lungs. The closer the broken back got, the more it seemed that there was a prosperous civilization on the planet, but that the swarms of life were not part of it. There were negligible artificial energy signatures, no communications net, and the one or two orbital installations were cold, ancient, and corroded. Now the broken back was the closest an unexpected craft could get and not run a severe risk of detection. The soul drinkers had turned to their chapter master for a decision. Even if we could be sure of landing the broken back safely, there's no landmass down there isolated or stable enough to serve as a landing zone. Varric, the tech marine who had been supervising the scans from the multitude of sensorium spines that stabbed from the broken back's hulls, was pointing out the few islands of any size on the giant hollow of the unnamed planet. The sensors had had some luck penetrating the freakishly dense cloud layers and could generate an image of the surface stripped of its pale shroud. We know that these are volcanic and active. They'd collapse under the Hulk's weight. The chapter's most able combat leaders were assembled in the audience hall of the noble's yacht that had evolved into Sarpedon's quarters and the center of his command. Most of them, like the glowering Gravis or the ever-present Gavrillion, were from the force that had been alongside Sarpedon since the Star Fort. They had earned his trust directly, and he knew their strengths. Some others were from the rest of the chapter, who had acclaimed him chapter master after the victory over Gorgolion, and were all marines who Sarpedon had fought alongside before. Sarpedon sat back in the throne that had once belonged to the noble whose chambers he had adopted. Landing the broken back was never an attractive option, he said. Could we use Thunderhawks? Or the drop pods? Not to strike directly at the enemy, Commander, replied Varric. A section of the globe lifted off the image and was magnified. It showed an archipelago, a chain of volcanic islands strewn across the ocean. The image was misted by clouds of interference. The librarian believed this is the origin point of the psychic emanations, said Varric. If we are to defeat the force that holds this planet, this is where we will find it. Sarpedon knew even before Varric had pointed it out. That was where the black flame burned. But it is also the point where the atmosphere is the most volatile, continued Varric. You can see the scans can hardly get through it. It's thick and stormy and completely impassable from the troposphere down. There's a layer that's effectively semi-liquid. It would be like trying to fly a Thunderhawk underwater. Then we will have to land them somewhere else, said Sarpedon. Any ideas? It was Sergeant Luco who stood up, smiling. Commander, I believe I may have an answer for you. The atmosphere thins out in patches further across the globe, specifically here. The view switched to a sickly scattering of islands. You will have been briefed that there was once a civilization on this world, probably human. These islands formed one of its centers. If there are any humans, are there any left? And what are they like now? asked Gravis gruffly. Sarpanon noticed he was flexing and unflexing his unnaturally long, powerful fingers. "'It's not them I'm interested in, Sergeant,' continued Luko. "'It's what they left behind.' 
The scans were more accurate through the thinner atmosphere, so the view could be zoomed in. Contours appeared, gnarled knots of basalt and cold, rippled lava flows. Luco picked out a section of coastline on the second largest island and shifted the hollow into a close-up of a large, natural harbor. Commander, we have no logistical structure on this planet, and the Thunderhawks cannot stop off for fuel if they're over the ocean of a primitive planet. But whoever lived on this world before it fell to the Dark Powers had their own ways of getting around. These. They could all see them. Ships. Three of them. Large and dark. Singularly ugly vessels built for stability and resilience rather than speed. Each was big enough to have been a major cargo vessel or troop transport. There look to be some very basic settlements on the island, continued Luco, but it's clear they devolved far from the people who built them. We won't know until we get closer, but the ships still look intact. So we sail in, said Sarpedon with a smile. Well done, Luco. Trust you to come up with the most unorthodox tactics possible. One which will leave us on an enemy-held planet an ocean away from the nearest support, said Dreo from the other side of the room. What happens afterwards? Sarpedon gave him a withering look. It does not matter, Sergeant. Even if there will be no afterwards, if there is a way we can get there, we must take it. I relinquished our choice in this matter when I took the Emperor as my guide. He turned to Varuk. We could refit the ships with engines from the Thunderhawks and travel under power. Can it be done? We would have to take a number of serfs with us to accomplish it, and they would be unlikely to survive for long given the environment. But yes, it could be done. Good. Baruch, Luko, I shall require a full tactical sermon in eight hours. If the details are sound, we shall proceed. I want some better scans of the archipelago and a full survey of potential drop zones. Fall out, brothers. The chapter librarian was as old as the chapter itself and in many ways older, for it had stemmed from the conclave of librarians in the Imperial Fists Legion in the time of Rogel Dorn. Every novice who showed psychic potential was tested rigorously by the librarian. Those who passed were trained in the control of their powers, more art than discipline, alongside the combat skills of a space marine. What happened to those who failed was irrelevant, for failure equaled death. It was a grueling process that none ever mentioned, but none ever forgot. Novices kneeled before a council of three librarians and had to keep their mind closed against the most brutal psych interrogation. Sarpedon himself had gone through this process and had passed with some distinction, for instead of just shutting his mind against the assault, he had reached out and woven a web of confusion amongst the interrogators. Every novice who made the grade did it differently, some blasting their tormentors across the interrogation chamber, others building an unbreakable wall of mental power. More than one had immolated themselves with mental fire and let the pain block out the probing, to wake up in a synth of flesh incubator with the assembled librarian applauding their success. When not in battle, the librarians acted as an independent advisory body to the chapter master, and it was in this capacity that Sarpedon had commanded them to build up a picture of the threat that awaited the chapter on the unnamed planet. There were seventeen librarians left in the chapter, not including Sarpedon himself, who had survived the violence the chapter had done to itself in the past months, and in their days-long meditative sessions they had carefully probed the psychic maelstrom that lay beneath the storm-laden clouds. It was a nightmare. Akar had died, his eyes pools of streaming jelly, and his organs burst and ruptured when he had peered with the psyker's sixth sense into the boiling mass of madness. The others suffered hideous nightmares, sometimes waking visions, of purple-black firestorms and canyons brimming with corpses. When they probed the darkness they could make out a location, the largest of a string of black coral islands forming an archipelago. There was something down there, burning bright with malice, wallowing in a pool of life. They could not give it a form or divine its powers, except that it was strong and held the planet under its thrall by force of will alone. Its will extended from the highest wisps of atmosphere to the depths of the oceanic trenches, 
and every living thing was corroded until it was mindless or enslaved. There was one thing more. Gleaned even as Sarpedon and Isair were addressing the assembled strike force in the new cathedral of Dorne. Tyrendian had found it, as he forced his consciousness deeper into the wailing madness than any had dared go save Akar, risking his sanity in the hope he would find something, anything, that might give them a clue as to what they were facing. He heard them, millions of them crowding the black coral cliffs, chanting, chanting its name, the Meth. Somewhere across that half-sighted horizon lurked Vemeth, a demonic power of vast brutality, corrupt and merciless. Commander Sarpedon had told them of its evil, and of the architect's wish for them to put it to the sword, but none of them really needed telling. They could feel it, a great horror throbbing beneath the deck of the Thunderhawk, watching them. For months it had been disturbing their dreams. Brother Zayan saw the unnamed planet for the first time through the open rear hatch of the Thunderhawk gunship as it screamed down low over the dark waves. The sky was purplish-gray, like an old bruise, a massive, heavy ceiling of rain-laden cloud. The seas roiled beneath in sharp waves, breaking against the scattered black rocks as the gunship roared at full tilt towards the island that formed their objective. Zayn had made airborne drops before, dozens of times in his still short career as a soul drinker, but not like this. They had always known something about the foe they were facing, even if it was only who they were. Unclean hordes of orcs holding the refineries on the ice caps of Gyrix, secessionists who had taken over the manufactoria of Achille Twelve. Here they had only a name, and an assurance that the foe was terrible indeed. The air swirled in the back of the Thunderhawk, and Zayn instinctively checked the survivability readouts reflected on the crystal of his helmet's eyepiece. He could breathe the air, but his lungs would have filled up with phlegm, and his eyes would have started streaming after half an hour. Armor discipline was to be made paramount, and helmets were to be worn. Closer now, and the dead volcanic peak rose like a broken tooth from the crags of the island. half form ruins rotted by corrosives in the air, clung to the rocks. They had once been majestic, but now they were like the moldering skeletons of civilization. One last check of the seals around his flamer's fuel cylinder. One last whispered word to the ever-watchful emperor, and to the vigilant Rogel Dorn, whose blood flowed in Zayn's veins. Squad Luca would be first out, and Zayn had the point where his flamer could buy a half-second if they found themselves facing danger. Zan had been in the same position when they dropped into the Demiurg positions at the Dog's Head River, and two aliens had died in the wash of his flame before Squad Luco's bolters had begun to open up. Was there fear? No, there was none. What lesser men felt as fear, a space marine felt as a high tensile readiness, a state of rarefied awareness that let him act faster, think quicker, hit harder where it counted. So were written the words of Dionathos, for a space marine shall know no fear. The razor-shop rocks hurtled by beneath as they headed over the coast. Black-gray shot through with the streaks of quartz. The Thunderhawk lurched to one side and flew in a broad curve as it descended, losing speed, dropping over a ridge on the final approach. The landing zone was a broad bowl of broken rock, a short run from the harbor, but far enough away from the nearest ruins. The Soul Drinkers would have to secure the landing zone before the Thunderhawks could land, which meant the gunships would have to stay in the air while the Space Marines swept the area. The engine pitch dropped as the Thunderhawk reached bailout level, four meters above the ground. Zayn jumped. They were still traveling at a fair pace when he landed, but he had done this many times before, rolling on and coming up on one knee, flamer braced, head jerking as he swept for contacts. For a second or two he held fast, as the remaining nine marines of Squad Luco hit all around him. The sergeant coming down halfway through, lightning claws spread like skeletal wings as he fell. Squad Luco down, no contacts, he heard the sergeant voxing to the command Thunderhawk. The acknowledgement blip sounded, and Luco raised a hand for them to follow. The storm-swept island seemed devoid of life. 
Indeed, it seemed hard to believe that anything could survive here. Zeon could see nothing moving, save the marines and the incoming Thunderhawks, and could hear nothing beneath the white noise of the ocean, the pounding of boots, and his own double heartbeat. Squad Luco moved a jog towards the harbor, careful to keep their feet on the cracked strata of rock. The harbor itself was like a bite taken out of the rock, and beyond it the ocean reflected the grim, dark gray of the sky. The volcanic peak of the island loomed to the rear of the landing zone, the sorry ruins zigzagging up the dark rock. Everything was covered in sea spray, glistening in the weak light. Movement, called Brother Griv on the squad box. North, northeast. Zan saw it a second after, something pale and spindly darting among the rocks in front of them. He knew that squads Gravis and Dreo would be dropping some distance away to form the two ends of the marine line. Squad Luca was in the center, and the next squads would fill in the rest of the line. They had twenty seconds, perhaps, on their own before the rest arrived. First blood, men! shouted Luco. Griv fired on the move and missed. Three more bolters took his range and hit. Something thin and humanoid flailed in pain, and another shot took off what must be its arm. The name of Squad Luco would be inscribed in the chapter records as taking first blood of the enemy on the unnamed planet. Zeon knew Luko took pride in such things. And, to tell the truth, Zeon felt the same. His hands were fairly itching to get close enough to use his flamer. Command, this is Squad Luko. Positive contacts. Repeat, contacts. Zeon glanced back and saw Lord Sarpanon himself disembarking with Gravillion leading his command squad. Sarpanon was majestic, his strong, taloned legs carrying him swiftly forward over the rock. Bolter barking at the figures scurrying toward the marines. Zeon saw the enemy properly for the first time. Humanoid, and perhaps technically human, but shambling, with sloped gates and lolling mouths. Luko slid into cover behind a lip of rock, and fired a burst from the bolt pistol worked into the back of his right lightning claw gauntlet. The squad followed him into cover. I want bolter discipline, men, and I'm counting every bullet, he yelled. Fire! There were more now, a dozen reaching out from the deep furrows in the rock where they had taken shelter. Their eyes were wide, watery saucers, and their skin streaked with blood and filth. This was what had happened to the human peoples that once called this planet home. They had perhaps been proud and noble until the meth came. Now, maybe generations later, the demon's influence had robbed them of intelligence and left them slack-jawed primitives, cannibals clutching clubs of human bone and chunks of sharp flint. Bolters chattered and a dozen fell, their soft, light-starved flesh coming apart. Zeon heard their moans of pain and anger beneath the gunfire. With their dead as cover still more poured from the cracks in the ground. Twenty. Fifty. A hundred. Hold, brothers, and close on my lead, called Luco the vox cutting through the jabbering of humanoids and the crackling of bolter fire. The creatures were within a half-dozen strides, clambering over the dead and jabbering with anger, their teeth gnashing and eyes glaring wetly with fury at the invasion of what passed for their home. Luco vaulted over the ridge of rock, and three of the enemy were dead before he landed, their torsos sliced to thick, bloody ribbons with a swipe of his lightning claws. A follow-up swipe tore another one into strength's lengthways in the flash of a discharging power field. The howls were screams now, the creatures a wall of sallow flesh rearing over Luko on a tide of broken backs. By then, Brother Zan was at his side, and Luko stepped back, dripping with watery blood, to let him do his work. Zan took the split second to check range and target density. Close and packed. Perfect. The pilot light on the tip of the flamer nozzle flickered hungrily, and Zan issued a silent prayer to the watchful Primarch as he squeezed the trigger handle in his gauntleted hand. The blue-white cone of flame ripped through the closest bodies, sure as any bullet, rendering four or five hapless subhumans into shriveling, flailing limbs half glimpsed in the flame wash. Those further away fared even worse, coated in a cloak of burning petrochemical that ate through their skin and left screaming, flaming skeletons spasming as they died. The closest survivors, many half aflame, screamed in pain and shock and ran. They took their fellows with them, 
and soon the subhumans opposing Squad Luko were in full rout, Luko himself laying into the closest with his shining claws, the squad bolters thudding shells into the disintegrating flesh of the fleeing pack. Zeon washed the ground with flame, scouring the few survivors into burning ash, melting the flesh of those who had fallen in their flight. Squad to me! Regroup! came Luko's order, and the squad strode over the sticky, burning remains of the cannibals to where their sergeant stood, the power field around his claws flickering as the residue of muscle and bone burned off. Zan knelt to the squad's four, ready to answer another ambush with a burst of burning justice. He could hear the crackle of gunfire as the fleeing creatures blundered into the fire zones of the other squads and were cut down in short order. There was a flash of light as the Psyker lightning lanced out and shattered a swath of fleeing bodies. It was Tyrendian, the librarian, lending his mental artillery to the fire of his battle brothers. Zeon knew the fleeing subhumans wouldn't return, not after so many of them had suffered the white heat of his flamer, the speed and savagery of Luko's claws, and the massed fire of the soul drinkers. They had taken first blood. The omen was good, one of the best for it promised the soul drinkers would meet the enemy face to face and bring their superior quality to bear. But these cannibal creatures were no kind of resistance. Just looking at the bruised sky and the murderous, polluted ocean promised that the real test was ahead, and the sternest of tests it would be. Zeon might not survive. Zeon didn't care. To die while partaking in the destruction of such evil was a victory in itself and whatever happened, his name would be inscribed along with his brothers in the tales of the first true battle of the only free chapter in the galaxy. He checked his flamer tanks. They were still nearly full of fuel. The weapon had barely cleared its throat yet. But he did not need the words of Dionathus to tell him that soon he would need every drop. Sarpedon scuttled up a rise of rock, watching the patrol squads cutting down the few straggling half-humans with placed gunfire. Assault squads saved ammunition and used their combat knives. Telos, easy to spot even at this distance with his bare, pale-skinned torso, was using them as practice for the complex twin-sword techniques he had found in the ancient combat records of the chapter archives. Sarpedon was pleased. It hadn't been much of a fight, truth be told, but his marines had responded with every bit of discipline and sharpness a chapter master of the soul drinkers could expect of his men. Squad Luco had faced the largest mass of them, and Gravis had found his unit nearly surrounded, but in each case the enemy had been broken rapidly and totally, then pursued to destruction. That had been three days ago, in which time Sarpedon had kept up aggressive patrols against the island's natives. He knew that activity, as much as rest, was needed to keep his troops battle-ready, and they would need nothing less than total focus. The Soul Drinkers were heading into an uncertain enemy, who might well have control of the battlefield in the most literal sense, if the Librarium Conclave was to be believed. It was not a situation he had not faced before, or that his Marines were not trained and experienced for, but they all knew those uncertainties multiplied the danger a hundredfold. This was an operation that, if it were not carried out by the soul drinkers, could not be carried out at all. He could see the three ships in the harbor, lit by showers of sparks as surf laborers fitted the power systems of the Thunderhawks into the hulls. The ships were well made, and the years had done surprisingly little to rot their hulls. They were made of some splendidly light hardwood and banded with quality iron. The sails had long since disintegrated in the foul winds, but the soul drinkers didn't need them, and indeed the masts themselves were being felled to reduce the profile of the ships against the horizon. These craft were a testament to the sophistication of the peoples that had once called this world home, and to the utter degeneracy that Vermes's influence created. Tech Marine Varuk was in charge of the engine conversions. Under his watchful eye, the Thunderhawk propulsion systems were becoming powerful water jet propulsion rigs that would send the ships carving across the ocean faster than the winds had ever sent them. The Thunderhawks, four of them stripped down for parts, stood on the open rocks, lashed to the stone with heavy chains. Sarpedon had brought four hundred soul drinkers onto the unnamed world, well over half the chapter's remaining strength. 
there was a very real chance that none of them would return, a chance every one of them understood. They would be vulnerable on the ocean. They were vulnerable now, not least because the dark power they were here to destroy could well know they had arrived. And even if everything went right, they would still be attacking what was in all likelihood a well-defended and fortified position, facing doubtlessly fanatical and even demonic resistance. And there was always the problem of whether they would even be able to get back to the orbiting broken back, regardless of their success on the ground. None of it mattered. They were here because they owed the Emperor, the architect of fate, for showing them the truth, because he demanded they prove their worthiness to count themselves as his divine warriors. If they had to die, then die they would. The only fear that death held was that they would die without having accomplished their life's work of service to the Emperor. But to die here, for a Marine to give his life facing such a foe for such a reason, was to accomplish more than the longest lived of the weak-willed Imperial servants could ever hope to achieve. The low, throaty rumble drifted across from the harbor as the engines were tested. They sounded healthy enough. No doubt, within a couple of hours, the Soul Drinker's task force would be heading across the ocean towards the lair of Vemeth. Sarpedon headed down the rocky ridge to supervise the Marines' embarkation onto the ships. Soon they would be gone from the island, leaving only a handful of surf laborers guarding the Thunderhawks and two hundred subhuman corpses. End of chapter 9. It's uh, it's getting intense. Lots of... Really seem comfortable killing their uh, enemies and killing random human natives and issuing causing their serfs to die. Almost like the soul drinkers are kind of assholes. Who knew? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, come back next week for more. We're getting rapidly towards the end, so everybody take care. Bye.